I believe that schools are the physical spaces in which children have the greatest exposure to systemic oppression. They're with us for eight hours a day as they come into our buildings. Yet they could also be places in which we um, can systematically humanize uh, and help to humanize their communities, students and their communities. For the past 20 years, I've worked closely with school leaders, and I've done so as a public school teacher and as an administrator. And though my experiences have been diverse, um, I, I began the book uh, with my experiences in Detroit, actually. Um, it was fascinating. It was a dynamic experience. I went to the University of Michigan undergrads, and I, and I, I chose to go back to Detroit. Um, both my parents were educator, educators. They also graduated uh, from the University of Michigan. Y'all know where that is, right? Okay, I'm just making sure. So, I felt love, rage, care, grief, hostility, uh, and even despair in my early years in, uh, as, a, as an educator in, on the east side of Detroit, actually, Cleveland Middle School. And I served all kind of minoritized students, not only black students, Albanians, Polish, poor, poor white students who couldn't afford to leave, uh, Bengali, it was, it's, a, it's a growing Bengali uh, enclave. It was right on the border of Hamtramck, so you all know that that is um, an enclave where immigrants came. Some Levantine Arabs, mainly from... Uh, uh, from uh, Syria or um, Lebanon. Uh, but what was troubling as, as I reflected is that early on I um, went on to sort of like accept deficit-based understandings about many of these poor students that I was serving. I was sort of mentored or, or uh, acculturated into repeating certain things that later when I reflected I said that was terribly oppressive. I had little knowledge of the context, the histories around Detroit and about how the federal government assaulted black neighborhoods and removed Black Bottom and Paradise Valley and places like that. Um, I didn't have the history about how crack cocaine was introduced or guns or some of the other social problems that I was seeing or the lack of jobs and so parents had to get their hustle on and would not be um, in front of me. I, I, didn't, I wasn't deeply aware of these contextual factors. And so for example, when colleagues said to me that um, they are not here because I would have, like, because of these social factors, one parent uh, during parent-teacher conference out of 100 show up. Um, it was easy for me to swallow and accept that uh, parents saying things like, you know, they don't show up because they don't care about their kids. Um, I so, so this is me as a socially black. My parents came into the Nation of Islam. I, I'm sure you all know what that is. Uh, and they were very socially conscious. I was actively involved in campus, so I was very socially inclined to do the right thing and chose to go to Detroit. Uh, and even me, I began to accept some of these defi deficit depictions of, um, of, of our students. Um, and so also when, they, when the parents came in aggressive or were apathetic, I also swallowed poisonous narratives about them along those lines. And so when parents came in and they were on edge or aggressive, I kind of accepted that. And so from there, I was Again, myself, an educated black man from a socially conscious uh, family deciding to teach in Detroit, and I, I, and I held and espoused deficit-oriented constructions of black students. I was complicit in the uh, oppression of African-American students. So um, that's, that and other reasons are, in essence, why I wrote this book. The book uh, has six chapters in it, and these are the six chapters, and we've developed a an eight-day, all-day, eight-hour curriculum that deeply, that we're going deep with superintendents and principals across the state of Minnesota. Uh, and so obviously in 30 minutes, <laughs> I can't cover much. But I'm going to try to do a little bit of work here um, with you just to kind of give you ta a taste. So um, I built this book on a number of different studies that I conducted over the years. Um, for example, one study involved a high school in the San, greater San Antonio, uh, Texas area. Um, that they were closing. It was, it was known as a black high school. Um, and the parents, black parents, revolted against the closure of that school. And so I looked at that. So data uh, on that is included in the book. I also looked at um, how administrators and school systems respond to requests for equity-oriented data. That's a study that's included in this book. But primarily throughout this book, uh, I, it rests on a two-year ethnographic, uh, ethnographic study that I did. Uh, and uh, it was in an alternative school in, uh, in the Detroit area. And so um, by including the community at deep level of, of, of schooling, I, it, I became interested in the, the relationship between schooling and community. So, so with these chapters, unfortunately, we don't have time to go deep on any of them. But if we do have time, um, 
the need for critical and self-reflective school leaders is one that I'll take a little bit um, more time with. So why don't we kind of just get started? So I begin acknowledging some of the assumptions of culturally responsive school leadership. Let me state, um, you know, that, for, well, the first assumption is that, and I'm going to state this very emphatically, 30 minutes ain't enough time. <laughs> um, but more seriously, um, deep learning is needed. There's an assumption in the academy that practitioners just want the solutions. Uh, they know they have problems. They just want the solutions. And <clears throat> it's been my experience that uh, in, this, in this academy that we're doing, um, that actually administrators do want to uh, go deep. They want to do some deep learning. They do want to, uh, uh, we talk about, for example, in the uh, academy, uh, a notion of unlearning, which means that you learn something and use that to unlearn something that you've been doing for a while. One mentor of mine said one time that it took me 20 years to unlearn what it only took me 10 years to learn. And what I found is that school leaders enjoy getting smart about these things. I've, I've very, very uh, enjoyable for them. <clears throat> I assume that leaders play a role. Uh, this, is, this is something I'm pushing because in much of the work on culturally responsive schooling, it's a, it's a very uh, heavy focus on instru in, uh, instruction and curriculum. Um, and there are many questions that have to be addressed by school leaders, like resources and how they can be allocated for community involvement. Um, how teachers can be trained. I mean, again, I went to a very reputable undergraduate institution for my teacher education, and I wasn't trained to be a culture to respond. So therefore, school leaders pick that task up when they come. Um, and so these are some other assumptions. Just very briefly, uh, I think that many of us are on the same page when we recognize that oppression is automatically reproduced. Uh, scholars can successfully enact culturally responsive school leadership. Uh, traditional school leaders, uh, and leadership models are often ineffective. So there's a lot of talk in my field about um, instructional leadership and transformational re leadership, distributive leadership. There's, there's a lot of written on transactional leadership. And all of these leadership sort of like behaviors are necessary, no doubt. But are they culturally responsive is the question. Are they, are they serving the minoritized students who have not been well served by public schooling and private schooling in the, in, in the country? And I would argue no. So I also, these are some other assumptions I have. I assume that community-based knowledge informs good leadership practice. So in other words, um, in order to unlearn, in order to check your epistemologies and assumptions that you walk in the door with as a leader, you, your colleagues, uh, there's, not, there's no evidence that colleagues have done that well. There's no evidence that more reading has done that well. I argue that one source, one tremendous untapped resource of unlearning is, are those community-based knowledges, ancestral knowledge, some people call it decolonial knowledge, other people call it. And so it's, it, and I end with the last assumption because there, there's, a, there's a trend, I would argue, in education in general to come out and critique, critique, and critique, and I support critique. Um, but we also need to find out what works. We need to find out how to build, not just to deconstruct. And so I, I, I assume that culturally responsive leadership will do both. It will, it will, also, it will indeed critique, but it will also look for community-based knowledges and epistemologies and stuff like that to bring to bear, not just to learn about it, but to bring to bear on how schooling is done and how policy and practice is formed within schooling. So why, why is there a need for culturally responsive school leadership? It can't just be about equity or test scores. Because if you only focus on equity, then you're saying to me that if I can get my black Somali students to get the same on a score, the same standardized test score as my white students, and to have a, a similar discipline rate, um, that we've achieved equity. You can, you can make that argument. Um, I argue, however, that based on a number of works, uh, not necessarily even my own, just a lot of people have reported that students who are successful in schooling give quite a bit up to do so, quite a bit of themselves up, uh, and quite a bit of parts of themselves that white students are not asked to give up, and that cannot be equity. So why culturally responsive school leadership practices? Um, School-centric approaches uh, of education have been the overriding way that schooling has been done, and they have unfortunately been oppressive and marginalizing. The book goes into great detail on the difference between community-centered approaches and school-centric approaches. School-centric approaches are concerned with things that will make the school more successful. So like test scores and attendance, 
But when I go talk to my parents uh, and family members in the hood, they don't really care too much about test scores. That's our thing as educators. They want to know how their children can be safe, how their children can be functional, how their children might be able to go to college after school. But the explicit emphasis on test scores is not a community thing. I'm sorry. School-centric approaches are based on Western ways of knowing. And by ways of knowing, I'll use the term epistemology, but it's not just of knowing. It's everything that a person brings to bear as they interpret their words around them. So it could be uh, discourses that they heard growing up. It could be things that they've read. It's things that they've seen. All of these things are in our minds, and everybody has their own unique epistemology. But unfortunately, the provincial white Western epistemology has been normalized for all of us, and we all interpret that as the epistemology. I'll say more about that later. Examples of oral traditions, um, self-defining, uh, the central role of community empowerment, all of these things are important for culturally responsive school leaders. And so, you know, uh, these privileges and marginalizations are now invisibilized, systemically embedded, and automatically reproduced via ever-shifting dynamic context. So I just want to kind of suggest that one of the ways that we can, okay, so I, I, another assumption is that culturally responsive school leadership is an ongoing iterative process that never ends. You don't come into your school building after working hard for three or four years or five years and say, now we're a culturally responsive building, because that's not the way oppression has historically worked in this, in this country. What um, bureaucracies are known to be institutions that reshape in order to um, it's in order to uh, affirm and to protect the hierarchies that have been in place. So when uh, you come and you put a policy up, those parents or those community members that have had greater access, all they do is shift. They shift and then try to continue to gain those same kind of things for people for whom they care about. So what are some characteristics of culturally responsive school leadership? Um, number one, uh, influences the school context and addresses cultural needs of students and parents, um, maintains a presence in the communities they serve, um, lead professional developments. So you can see that there are things that school leaders typically do, like this professional development piece, or um, working directly with teachers, mentoring teachers, and, uh, but, and there are things that are less done, right? Inclusive environments for minoritized students, it's a very evasive endeavor for school leaders because when if you talk to them I do equity audits for districts around the country and one of the questions I ask is are you comfortable and are you safe in school and almost inevitably the teachers and the administrators will say yes 70 percent of them 80 percent of them will say yes our students are comfortable our students are safe and then the same question is when it's put to students and parents is 10 20 30 percent so are you inclusive is an open question but it's not allowed to be answered simply by people working in schools. So let me uh, do something that I, I debated about whether I should do, but I'm just going to try to run through this uh, rather quickly. And that is, I want to dig a little bit deeper into these indigenous and community-based epistemologies. Uh, a lot of times when people talk about this, this work, they start with um, Jim Crow. Some go back as far as slavery. My argument is that we need to go uh, back a bit further because what districts often ask is, how do we uh, become, do anti-bias work. How can we get to the root of this? And I argue that two things. Number one, you cannot just implement any. So, so this, uh, um, restorative justice is very popular these days. People say, hey, can you help us do a restorative justice program in our school? And my, an my answer to them is no reform to you. Any reform you bring will not work if your teachers and your administrators have not gone through a parallel cultural conscious training with that reform that you're trying to bring in. Because all you will do is retrofit the reform on historical practices that you've been doing in schools, okay? So they wanna go straight to, I, 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 you know, I've talked to principals, look, we, we know we've been dealing with this issue for years, we've hired new teachers. So everybody on, in the building wants something different. And we all know intentions are not enough. Everybody wants something different. The problem though is that they, want just you to give them the solution without going through some necessary stuff like this. And I, I do take some of this up in the book. It is a book written for practitioners, so I don't take it 
uh, very uh, deeply, but I encourage you to research the Valadoy debate, 1952, uh, I'm sorry, 1552. Uh, the, essentially, uh, when the Spanish, when the Spanish and Isabella ran the North African Moors out of Spain, I'm going to just leave all of the details out of this. It was the first time, it, nobody can claim that white Europeans got the upper hand on Africa and colonized the world because they were more intelligent. You had an 800 year dynasty in southern Europe that introduced most of the sciences upon which Western civilization rests. Uh, oceanography, astronomy, algebra, all of these things, the first books of medicine, the first universities, it wasn't a question of intelligence. What it was a question of is th that white people in Western Europe were willing to subhumanize themselves by treating others like animals for the first time in human history. And so this subhumanization that they did to themselves uh, led to a debate in 1552, the Valadoy debate, where Sopaveda is arguing that these people are less than human because why? Because they don't have a religion. If you don't have a religion, you don't have a God. If you don't have a God, you don't have a soul. You can be sold like animals. You can be treated in this way. And the system of encomienda that they did on the Moors, the Jews, women, and others who had any other source of knowledge that differed from the Christology tradition at that time in the, in the um, monarch. Whereas uh, de la Casas uh, and others argued that no, they are indeed human, but they're savages, so you must desavagize. What I argue in the book and in other places is that these two lines of understanding people follow through institutions and exist. So when people, when you encounter colleagues in schools and they say and they describe black people or indigenous people in this way or that way, I argue that almost everything you'll hear can be traced back to one of these lines of reasoning about how people exist. So I encourage you to, um, to uh, there's so much more to say. Uh, I encourage you to read up on that. Um, and so when you see, for example, in 1899, I would ask you the, the ethnicity of the child, but there's a huge hint right on the screen. As the United States in, um, um, took control of the Philippines and, and, and purchased or bought the Philippines, uh, of course, we, we uh, Americans had to tell themselves about the Philip. Now you can clearly see that the child on the screen resembles either an indigenous or black child. What must you do aside from uh, depict a, a child or a people in the uh, imagery of a familiar enemy in order to colonize those people, in, in order to take control of that without um, unearthing? right, the, these sensibilities against it. So um, I, I, I do have this image in the book and, we, and, I, and I theorize a little bit about it there as well. So as we talk about the difference between, I'm, I'm getting to leadership. I know you all are like, I, I know you all are like, hold on a second, I thought this was about school leadership. I'm getting there. I'm, I'm trying to do some of what I suggested needs to be done, which is kind of just briefly learn about some things so that we can d dig into it. And you, when we get there, you're not, then you're either confused now or confused then. So I chose now. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I, I, I do dig into both material and discursive considerations around this, this epistemology. Material is you go into a school, you say, okay, this school has less resources than that school. Let's look at the test scores from each school and so on and so forth. So it's a very measurable standard. Discursive, though, we're not necessarily interested all that much in that as much as we are as why those differences exist, right? So what is the, what, what are those things that are in the minds of people? And they may not know it, they likely don't know, why they tend to be arguing or allocating more money for this school to that one. And I argue that there are discursive, there are ways that those communities are depicted, for example. So some people at the state level might say something like, well, you know, these schools, you know, they, they don't value the research. We're not going to put a library there if they don't. So the fact that it was said that they don't value that is, is something a little bit deeper. And uh, that, that's what I'm trying to get to at, with this and in the book. So uh, I won't go through all of these things. You can read these on your own. But some of the ways that uh, people and, and our histories have been described as, uh, as primitive. And so primitive, primitivism is... Um, for the most part, it plays into part of the ethnographic uh, imagination that preoccupied Africa. And so, um, the, the, you know, this whole savage, at the same time that they're uh, savage and prone to irrational violence, right, they have other depictions depending on what, uh, 
the, the Western imaginary needed at that time, for example, um, um, that, that they're trusted and reliable helpers and at the same time savage, or that they're loving and at the same time violent, right? So you see that in primitive, primitivism. Uh, Edward Said, and I'm sure many people in here are familiar with his work in terms of his description of people from the Orient versus the Occident. So describing them as both hedonistic and sexual and at the same time clever and sagacious, right? And so uh, people from Turkey and the Middle East. Uh, and, and then, of course, you have tropicalization. And to tropicalize people essentially means that you go to Latin America and you find these people who are exotic from the tropics, right? And at the same time, they are lazy, right? And so uh, this, th these type of discursive or these um, descriptions, uh, what, what's it, uh, what, what I've, I've kind of talked about in the past, but when I say discursive, I mean non-material. And what I mean is uh, things that have entered our literature and our film and our culture and how people are exoticized in film as, you know, you have this one black guy coming in the film to the troubled white family. We've all seen films like this before the troubled white family falling out of control, and then by the time the film is up, the black guy dies or leaves and disappears, and the white family is intact again, right? And so these kind of discourses that have accompanied actions and behaviors and communities are terribly important for culturally responsive school leaders. So, of course, what we said about Indians, remember the Valadoy debate in 1552 is that they were savages. So about Indians, they were not subhuman in, in ways of physical uh, DNA. Rather, they were subhuman in their savagery. So for them, we had to kill the Indian and save the man. Or as uh, uh, John Riley said uh, here, who was an Indian school superintendent, all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. And of course, if you look into black emancipation, the question has to be asked, black emancipa emancipation into what? For this uh, painting, which is a pre-Civil War painting, mind you, uh, entitled The Study of Liberty, you can see that even though it was depicted as the first um, um, uh, abolish, uh, 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 excuse, abolitionist picture, uh, you, can, you can clearly see that these, the subservient position of the blacks and the white one who has conveyed knowledge and all of these other uh, things in the picture that really leads, le le leaves a very troubling picture in the mind of people who, um, w d who do buy into this abolitionist world for uh, African slaves. Uh, all right, how does this connect to schools? Let's move forward. Let's leave out Jim Crow, lynching, and all of these things. <laughs> Let's just move into schools, all right? So in the book, uh, this table exists, and what does all of this stuff about colonialism and discursive and material othering mean for minor minoritized and white students in school and educators? Uh, and here today, for educational leaders, right? That's what we're talking about today. By revisiting this history, I'm making several plain claims that colonial structures uh, were, by definition, racial and racialized structures, and they have entered into the DNA of schooling, and in particular, school structures and leadership. Culturally responsive school leaders must themselves and use school resources and structures. That's very important, right? And non-exoticizing, but uh, and non-appropriating ways to community-based and what some scholars call decolonial epistemologies and knowledge in order for schools to become humanizing. Culturally responsive school leadership can be a form of administrative agency as well through which conscious school leaders attempt to constantly, because remember it's ongoing, redress the school system that always seeks to protect interest of the state above all other interest. Um, the term minoritize is defined in the book, so why don't we just kind of speed ahead because time is short. Um, so now we get into the chapters. The, the, the first non-like scholarly chapter is about uh, student identity, and the second is about inclusionary school spaces. So why don't we um, start just kind of with that. Um, we all know that promoting inclusive spaces for minoritized youth is something that uh, continues to befuddle schools. Uh, minoritized children are connected to particular spaces. And so all of this talk about colonization and the discursive imaginary around minoritized students and all of these things are very relevant when our uh, educators in schools when they see a black student or an indigenous student or a Latino student 
and they have an imagine, imagination in their mind about what areas the students are from, that's deeply connected. And those external spaces now are in front of them. You can choose not to drive down the street and go to that neighborhood, but you can't choose not to engage the student in front of you. But you begin to engage the student as you would engage people down had you drove down the street. Uh, down the street. So space is con contested yet dynamic. Um, and s instead of reading through this, I, I believe they're going to share the slides. So why don't we just kind of get to um, uh, what, what one of the main arguments that I made in the chapter um, around the data that was reported out in that chapter. And um, j just kind of look at this flow chart. Um, first, uh, you have on the end, firmly and publicly commit to anti-oppressiveness. So it, it begins with the commitment. Um, build trust with students and, our, and, and as well the community. Invite community people and prospective epistemologies into your space. Build consensus with students and what behaviors should be changed. And last but not least, publicly and privately encourage students to uh, change, to be inclusionary. So uh, you, you'll notice in this continuum, before you get to this, which is where school, uh, most of us educators started on day one, and in Detroit it was very, I mean, you were defined as a teacher based on how well you control your class, first and foremost, right? So we started here. Instead of building trust, learning about the historical context, learning about the epistemologies, and then you will eventually get to this. You, you should all know that we, didn't, we don't sag pants for the rest of our lives. You do know that, right? We start out doing that, hat to the back, cornrows. We grow out of that, though. We, we do, if given the opportunity. I also talk about something um, that I um, refer to as identity confluence, meaning that let's say that he does come to school with his pants down. What does that have to do with the math, t math test? That's what you said you cared about. And so um, <clears throat> this uh, first sentence by Joe, who was a primary uh, source of data for this book, who was uh, just fantastic. Uh, he's, he's passed away now. Fa it, it, older, in the 70s, still culturally relevant for students, um, said, I don't care who you say you are, can you learn? So he embodied this coming to school, he said that he caught marijuana. Now, he didn't encourage these behaviors, but only and, on, and only after he built the trust could he say, look, put that reefer down, put that marijuana down. Had he done that from day one, maybe that would not have happened. But what essentially, um, these, these is, this is another table that I included in the book, uh, examples of student behaviors and teacher responses. So I do distinguish between dehumanizing behaviors, humanizing, and then something that I refer to in the book uh, as identity confluence, meaning whatever identities the students come with, merge that with an academic identity as opposed to trying to change that identity. And so here are some examples of, of, of how that happens. And, and then in the book, I eventually do get to some of the nuts and bolts of leadership, right? So uh, this is a traditional model versus a much messier culturally responsive school leadership model which could also change, by the way. So this isn't written in stone. But you, one, one clear difference you'll notice is that I'm looking for those community-based epistemologies, community-based lenses. I'm looking for parent and community knowledge and for those to kind of inform all of the other aspects of schooling and for that to impact student performance in a more effective way. And so, um, I, I do play with some models in the book, and also I, I actually take up um, humanizing communities of practice, uh, which is um, professional learning communities. You know, it's probably the, one of the more popular technologies or reforms that schools you can find almost in any district across the country. And I ask the same questions, the same four core questions that they ask in that, but I just add sub-questions that push for minor, uh, minor, the, the humanization of minoritized students. <clears throat> And um, so there is uh, an earlier chapter in the book. This, this is much of the same last slide, just um, listed in, in different form. The, the, the third chapter in the book deals with critical self-reflection. And so I thought that given our time that we have about four, four or five minutes left, <laughs> um, I, uh, I thought I would go just a little bit deeper with this particular chapter and try to unpack it. Now, of course, I'm a, I'm a black man, so I'm gonna center black male experiences in, in this chapter as I, so, so this, is, this is out of 
order as it appears in the book, but I wanted to take this chapter a little longer, so I, that's why I left it at the end. So this whole thing, this, this perhaps is one of the areas in which culturally responsive school leaders are most comfortable. They like talking about the fact that they're, you know, a gay uh, white man and, you know, middle class background. Um, and and I, I, I do think that the personal critical self-reflection is very important. The, one of the main uh, arguments for this chapter, however, is that you cannot um, allow yourself to only be personally critically self-reflective. You must have ongoing, regular, critical self-reflective practices for every program and your entire institution. How does that happen? Because what happens is that school leaders think that if they are personally critically self-reflective, that all of a sudden that would just extend into the practices and the outcomes. And it, does, it never happens. Never happens. You get the, you, you know, everybody's sitting around, they got the Kleenex out, they're crying. <laughs> You know, the, you know, I, uh, I heard my father use the N term and then all of us, the, the N word. And then all of a sudden you think that those conversations are going to lead into shifts in, in, in your data. And it, and it doesn't happen like that. Right. So um, th this this flow chart, which also exists in the book, I start by asking, how do I personally reflect on my histories of privilege, power and oppression? But by the time the circle completes, I've also asked about how I lead my staff. And how are the structures in school? And there's another table that, for example, looks at a curriculum and how critical self-reflection touches not just the person, but the structure of every aspect of your schools. And so, for example, um, when I look down the list, I, I highlighted in the book personal, uh, content, structural, uh, community-based, like are you engaging communities in ways that are useful and non-exoticizing, are you going there? So if you go into a community and you say, you know, I want to go learn about this community so I can improve schooling, to me, I mean, I'm arguing that in the book, but that's still a bit exoticizing. That's still a bit exploitative because what are they getting out of that, right? And so organizational and, and, and um, self-sustainable. So let's, let's try to do some of this together. Essentially, um, the criminalization of black boys in school, uh, the, the gentleman on the left is arrested for sagging his pants. These gentlemen are arrested in school for throwing balloon fights, something that I think happens on every senior skip day across America. Uh, and so our solution as educational institutions have been to militarize boys. So we got to get those boys in shape, introduce them to more discipline. Um, and those who are not conformed are often uh, contained or eliminated, uh, as was Philando Castillo, who was killed a mile from my home. Um, and every time we drive by that, we're re-traumatized about, about what has happened. And so um, some of my cl concluding thoughts, um, establishing uh, community credibility, rapport, and trust must be center point in terms of what culturally responsive school leaders do. Uh, we have to come to terms with the fact that communities have goals for themselves. And just because they allow their children to come to us for eight hours a day does not mean that we can ignore their self-determination and their community empowerment goals. Uh, properly honoring community-based epistemologies, community-based knowledge. When I say properly honoring, we're not even at the le level that we recognize that we need them in schooling. But even when we do recognize them, that we do need them, we have to engage them in ways that are sensitive. We're not training them to give them what we want them to give us. And that we are dealing with them on their own terms. And, and last but not least, uh, there is no neutrality in some of the things that I'm saying. Those who say that um, I am beyond this, uh, I'm neutral, it's just about learning, um, then they are, re they are replicating colonial models of education. Um, they are being school-centric, not community-centric, and they are continuing the oppression of our uh, minoritized youth. Thank you.